Okay, thanks for coming. And um, a warm welcome to Val, who's been here uh, doctoring Bob today. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, Val and I have known each other for 20 years. So, Val was an undergrad, actually, he wrote uh, an email to me uh, asking about a paper. He reminded me last night when I picked him up from the airport. Uh, when he was an uh, undergrad at St Andrews. And then after St Andrews, he went to uh, EOMAR to do a PhD. And then that was followed by a lectureship at uh, Trinity in Dublin, where he stayed until 2008. Correct. 2008. And then uh, for the last 10 years, he's been the uh, chair in Trilogy at uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. So we're very glad that he's here and uh, talk to us about this momentous event. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Well, thank you for having me, and um, I'd like to talk this afternoon about Krakatoa, 1883. It's one of these uh, events that, uh, at least to me, has been very fascinating since small childhood. It actually, my journey to Krakatoa started as a six-year-old on my parents' sofa. And uh, you can't quite believe it, but I watched this movie as a six-year-old, oops, as a six-year-old, and I rewatched it a few years ago. It, uh, it was more impressive when I was six years old. But um, um, it left a deep impression on me as a small boy. In fact, Krakatau is not east of Java, it's west of Java that comes on top of it. But um, back then, this concept of volcanoes erupting, people being in danger, it really got me. And I think it's been instrumental in my career choice, to a certain degree at least. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about my journey and my impressions of Krakatau and uh, some work we're doing there. But first of all, Krakatau is one of the most famous, most well-known eruptions and volcanoes in the world. My mom wouldn't know much about uh, volcanoes, but Krakatau, that rings a bell to her. And here's just some examples of uh, how the name has become a, a milestone in a way. So you can have bodies scrubbed with pumice inside, and there's chocolate cigarettes from France called Krakatoa, there's spicy peppers, and there's even a rock band. I never listened to them, to be honest, but uh, well, here we go. So everybody tries to capitalize on the concept of Krakatoa. And uh, you may have seen this, it's a, it's a product from the UK, I understand. Krakatoa foam, you can make your drink there. It's called the blast from the past. And uh, yeah, so I, I never tried that either, but uh, I'm quite fascinated by it. Maybe I should stress at this point, Krakatoa is, uh, is actually a spelling mistake. It's if you like the international spelling, the Indonesian spelling is Krakatau. So you will see both versions in my talk today. So the 1883 eruption is one of the most famous, if not the most famous eruption of all time, I believe. Uh, however, it's neither the biggest uh, recorded eruption nor the most stately one. There has been much more disastrous ones. So, and it happened in what we would today call a remote spot somewhere <laughs> deep in the Dutch colonies. So what's behind this Krakatau phenomenon was one of the questions I asked myself, and how did it reach such a claim? Why is it so important. So what's behind the myth is the first part of my talk this afternoon and I will therefore explore the 1883 events. Then I shall take you on a little tour to Krakatau today, particularly to Anna Krakatau and the new volcano growing inside the caldera. And then I will report a little bit on ongoing work we're doing trying to unravel the plumbing system that feeds Anna Krakatau and I hope to wrap up uh, with a nice little model at the end. So the largest eruption the world has ever seen is Toba, which erupted about 74,000 years ago in northern Sumatra, and it's uh, pretty high on the volcanic explosivity index. It's eight on that scale, and uh, it's the largest next to Yellowstone that we know of. The eruption of Tambora in 1880, uh, 1815 is the second biggest. It's uh, on an index, on a VEI index of seven. And then we have uh, Taupo in New Zealand, which is VEI 6.5. And Krakatau is considerably smaller than any of these. So the question is valid, I believe. Why is Krakatau so 
prevalent in our minds. Here is just a, a very simple sketch to give you an idea. Mount St. Helens erupted 0.9 cubic kilometers of uh, magma in 1980. Krakatau erupted something like 20 cubic kilometers as a maximum. Um, Toba is, is 2,000 something cubic kilometers. So Krakatau is comparatively small, yet it left this huge imprint on our minds. So for that, I think we need to explore a little bit about uh, what happened back then and uh, what was the the era in which this event happened. And uh, well, I think the first myth, so to speak, that we need to clear up is that it was not in a remote place. In fact, it's in the Sunda Strait. This has always been a naval highway, a naval hotspot, if you will. All the shipping traffic that's going to China, for example, is going through the Sunda Strait and still does so. If you're driving a Toyota, it probably came through the Sunda Strait. So, um, here's a little map, and uh, here's the Sunda Strait, and uh, Batavia is the old name for Jakarta, which is the present-day capital of uh, Indonesia, and uh, a lot of shipping traffic had to go through there. Here's some old images, and uh, the Dutch, who had the colonial power at the time, they uh, uh, built a lot of um, uh, canals in Batavia, Jakarta today, and you can see this in the little drawing to the lower right there. So it's Apparently, it was a beautiful place, and uh, loads of people went there, and anything that happens in the Sunda Strait is still an issue for today's economy, because, uh, yeah, you have to get the Toyotas to Europe. So, um, here's a little quote, everything in Batavia is spacious, airy, and elegant, which was written by the Dutch traveler here, W. A. Rees, in 1881, and here's just a few impressions from back in the day. So, there was nothing remote about this. This was a pretty cool place, I think. Here are a few more impressions. So, and another point that is quite important here is the 1883 eruption of Krakatau was the first catastrophe, in inverted commas, that uh, took place after the worldwide telegraph network had been established. So the message that was sent around at that time was the island of Krakatoa in the Straits of Sunda, the center of the late volcanic eruption, is said to have disappeared. And this went around the world in uh, lightning speed, if you will, and uh, literally everyone kind of heard about this at the time. If you had a little eruption in Indonesia or any other place somewhere in the southern hemisphere, it wouldn't have really made a huge impact prior to telegraph uh, networks. But this had changed at that time because this was really a globalization on a very rapid kind of scale. So here's a few impressions again from the time. Here's a Dutch newspaper, Krakatau. Um, it says the first and the last issue because Krakatau erupted and the island was gone then. And uh, here's a few more impressions there. The image in the lower part, it's a bit oversteepened, I believe. It didn't quite look that dangerous because, well, people really got uh, interested in it after it blew up, not beforehand. So. So here's some quick facts on the volcano now. Three major caldera forming eruptions are reported, the 1883 one, then there is one allegedly that happened in 530 AD, and then there is one that is even older, 60,000 um, before present. We have limited information about this. This is almost more of a legend, I believe, but um, the other two are probably quite real, and certainly the 1883 one is real because it caused 36,000 casualties. It's uh, believed that it produced up to 20 cubic kilometers of eruptive products, and it left a huge caldera. A new edifice grew inside the caldera. It's called Anak Krakatau, the child of Krakatau, and it emerged in 1927 to 1928. So, um, these larger, older eruptions, as I said, whew, they are a little, they're a little less well constrained, and um, I'm not entirely sure whether we really have this uh, convincing evidence that some people claim about the 60,000-year-old one, but there's good calls on the 530, 535 one. So, what we know about that time is that there was a change in the power structure in Java and Sumatra. It's also believed that it had uh, larger 
major effect. Some people have argued that it could have been responsible for causing the Dark Ages in Europe. It was the time the Roman Empire collapsed. There was changes in land ownership that are reported from that time even in Sweden. And uh, this was about 540 AD. In fact, there's something peculiar going on. Garnet treasures in Europe were suddenly sourced locally, while prior to that, they came from Asia. So a lot of people, geographers and others, have speculated that there was a giant eruption and Krakatau has been the one where people pointed the finger at. And uh, here's a quote from John of Ephesus from the sixth century. It says, uh, the like of which had never been seen or reported before, the sun became dark and its darkness lasted for 18 months. Each day it shone for about four hours and still this light was only a shadow. It was declared that the sun would never recover its full light. The fruits did not ripen and quite bitter, I guess he was about this point, the wine tasted sour. So, um, something happened, and it's quite likely that it was a big volcanic eruption, and from all we understand, it was round about the, um, um, <clears throat> the equator, equator region, so Krakatau is, is, is a good candidate for that. The Book of Kings, uh, although it was only written up in the late 18th century, reports some oral traditions from Java. So it was written prior to the 1883 eruption. And people couldn't really have known about what's going to happen at, in 1883. But this book reports that um, not only did this, uh, did this heavy rain not extinguish the eruption of fire of Mount Kapi, which we believe to be Krakatau, but it augmented the fire and the noise was fearful. I guess we would call it a free magmatic eruption today. So, uh, at last, the Mount, uh, mountain Kapi, with a tremendous roar, burst into pieces and sank into the deepest of the earth. The water of the sea rose and inundated the land. Um, Rachabaza is a volcano in Sumatra, which is pretty much on the right side for being affected if Krakatawa erupts. So, the inhabitants were drowned and swept away with all their property. And strangely and sadly, this is kind of what happened in 1883 again. So, an event like this most likely occurred before and uh, therefore this concept of an eruption in 530-ish is probably quite real. So, after the 530 eruption, Krakatau probably was uh, quiet for some time and uh, the next thing I could found is that by the 17th century the main island was forested. There's some uh, naval reports for this and uh, there were some hot springs. There was also outcrops of sulfur that were mined by some locals and sold off to make dynamite and things like that. And over the centuries, uh, the Krakatau archipelago has been used by the Dutch East Indies companies, the VOC, uh, as a naval reconnaissance station. And uh, they had a small shipbuilding repair site there. It was even for some time used as a kind of Alcatraz prison situation because it was pretty remote. Captain Cook was there. He stopped by on the main island of Krakatau in 1771 and uh, the botanist on the vessel recorded that at night they anchored on the high island called Krakatoa. In the morn when we rose we saw that there was three, uh, there were many houses and cultivation. So people actually lived there. Today there's nobody there. Six years later, Mr. Cook came in again, and um, well, the fields uh, of vegetation that were still to be found. There was pepper uh, being grown and harvested and things like that. However, se ten years later, these had all disappeared. And the Dutch uh, administrator of the region uh, reported on this loss of agricultural income. And uh, something, therefore, was changing at that time, probably in preparation of the big event in 1883. Just after midnight of May 10th in 1883, the lighthouse keeper along the Sunda Straits, they recorded tremors. And uh, five days after this initial tremors were recorded, um, it got more intense. The Dutch uh, inspector in the, in the region, in South Sumatra, Mr. Bionic, he was quite disturbed by this. And uh, he sent a telegram on May 15th to uh, Batavia um, reporting that uh, there's powerful tremors and uh, they are going up and down the Sumatran coast. So he was clearly worried. His wife had a different attitude towards it. She was bothered, but she also says that the um, vibrations were best seen in the water barrels and they made pretty ripples. So, uh, yeah. 
At that time, uh, fishermen came to Mr. Bionic and uh, they reported that uh, Krakatau is getting active. And uh, he was quite alarmed by this. And uh, he started to go out to Krakatau. And what he reports is that there was waves upon waves of floating pumice that were encountered, masses of pumice, a chart floating trees and all that. And the closer they went to the Krakatau Islands, the more of this they saw. And uh, there was belching fire, he reported, at the northern beach, and there was explosions. So I think we would now realize from a today's perspective that uh, the volcano was waking up, it was preparing for quite some time, and now it's really in the state where things get quite serious. But naturally, back then, people really didn't have a full grasp of how volcanoes behave, and this was not something they fully understood. So, Mr. Bionic went back through the falling night and um, he reported uh, in, a telegraph, in a telegram that um, this is the situation and a few minutes later he actually got a reply and it says that other reports like this have come in as well. So, um, however, a few days after these events, the volcano calmed down and in mid-July the activity was renewed. <coughs> So the time was uh, unfortunately lost because uh, people then calmed down as well with the volcano and uh, no preparations were taken. It was not until mid-July then that uh, the vessel Elizabeth, uh, returning from China, uh, reported that they saw white cumulus clouds, as they called them, rising very fast and they were rising almost vertically. They estimated that they were reaching 11,000 meters. At about four um, in the afternoon of that day, um, a light breeze brought a fine ash and dust and uh, um, the ship uh, crew was very unhappy because they had cleaned the ship for the journey home and now they reported it looked like a floating cement factory because of all the fine ash that was falling at the time. The ship's doctor described Krakatau as uh, uh, emitting a giant cauliflower or a, um, uh, like a steam locomotive. So they realized something was going on and there was emission of ash and a lot of gas at that time. Well, human nature is peculiar at times. Uh, we would nowadays realize this is dangerous, but back then, uh, the Dutch, ne the Netherlands Indies Steamship Company, they started to offer excursions to them. Agreeable excursions, and they were 25 guilders. I'm not quite sure how much it is, but it sounds affordable. And um, yeah, the first trip to Krakatau, the erupting Krakatau Island, had 86 passengers. And here's some reports from this. Uh, some people were quite alarmed, others enjoyed it, it seems. Steaming through the night towards a purple fiery glow that uh, could be seen in the middle of the Sunda Strait. Another person reports the view of the island was fantastic. And another person was uh, quite horrified by this and uh, clearly seeming to realize the um, destruction that would come from this. <clears throat> At that point, um, Dr. Fairbeck, who was a Dutch survey geologist, he was on vacation in Java. He was able to pay a short visit and he sketched the four islands. He took a small boat from the northern end. He sampled what uh, he realized was a very untypical rock for usual andesite type volcanoes in Indonesia. And uh, he realized it's a glassy rock and uh, he sampled obsidian from there. And uh, we would nowadays realize, oh, high silica things, this is likely a little bit more dangerous than just flowing lava, basaltic or basaltic andesite, as you would get from many of the other volcanoes in Indonesia. So now, on August 11th, um, the Dutch army captain Frasenar was ordered to inspect the island, and um, he spent two days there. And um, he counted 14 vents at that point, and uh, he described it as quite violent. A detailed survey of the island is inadvisable, he comes back and reported. And um, there's various logbook entries from that point, vast eruptive column, shakes heavy blows, falls of ash, and all that kind of thing. Dull explosions on the 26th of August. And uh, the Sealand, another vessel sailing back to Holland at that point, passed within five miles of Krakatau, and they reported loud noises, deafening noise, and they compared it to artillery, heavy artillery fire or machine gun fire. So at this point, the volcano was really just at the brink of blowing up. 
On Monday, August 27th, 1883, the cataclysmic event happened and uh, this um, led to the culmination and a giant explosion around about 10 o'clock in the morning. It's estimated that it was two minutes past 10 and uh, I'll tell you a little later how we get to this precise time. And, um, it was described from one of the vessels as if thousands of white balloons had been released from the crater. This is Anna Krakatau, the image there, and it's much smaller, but you get the idea where these thousands of balloons might have come from. So, Anger, which is a village at the coast um, um, in Java, um, it was soon enveloped in dust and clouds, became strangely dark. The telegraph messages from Anger, they read like this, Krakatau is vomiting fire and smoke. A few minutes later, it says, it is so dark in town that it's no longer possible to see one's hand before one's eyes. Detonation increase in loudness, hails of pumice, rain of coarse ash, unusual darkness, and then flooding. The vessels are breaking loose in the harbor, and then the telegraph message is stopped. So the harbor master at that point is recorded to have assembled the Dutch population, um, not the locals, and he told them, well, well, it's not a big deal, it'll soon blow over. They did not leave the place. Well, neither of them made it, obviously, because there was the big tsunami afterwards. The British vessel Medea uh, estimated that by mid-afternoon of that day, the column had risen to about 17 miles. And, uh, whoa, that's the height of Mount Everest. So uh, Medea's captain reported electrical displays and um, explosions. In Batavia, in uh, the 1880s, gas street lamps were uh, supplied with gas from containers which were uh, changing in pressure. They were filled up and then they were running um, empty and then they were filled up again. And because of this, there's good records of this and here's some pressure diagrams from the Batavia Gas Works. And you can see the spike on the right-hand side, which is the explosion of Krakatau. And also in the harbor, the, the tide uh, was measured and at 12.36, a huge wave came in and it's traveling very fast. And uh, if you do all your calculations, it goes back to Krakatau at 10.02. This was the source of the big wave. So at this point, weather observatories all over the globe, uh, Greenwich, Glasgow, Oxford, Vienna, Berlin, Leipzig, etc. They all recorded the same thing. They confirmed an instant. Uh, they confirmed that there was a huge pressure wave that swept all around the globe several times, in fact, and that the origin of this must be in the Sunda Strait. So here we have an interesting aspect, and that is that it was an event that. It was recorded all over the globe and people had a similar impression and this was really a globalizing effect of this eruption and I think this is part of the reason why it's so well known. So this is a traceable instant um, where a natural event was really leaving an impact on virtually everybody at the time and uh, this was not something in uh, Victorian times that had happened too frequently. So here is uh, Krakatoa before the big eruption in 1883, and uh, then we have the remnant of Rakata Island, which uh, is just a small leftover of the original volcano. Here's a few reconstructions, and uh, we believe that ancient Krakatau had a nice little edifice that was conical, but uh, in the 1883 eruption, much of this was lost. Likely there was already parts lost before, and uh, here in the lower part of this reconstruction, you see Rakata Island again, and the other islands that mark the caldera's boundary. In the center, the gray image gives an impression of uh, how the island probably looked according to Fairbrack's descriptions, and, uh, well, the little satellite image below shows how it looks today with Anna Krakatau being the volcano in the middle of it. So, much of this island was really blown to shreds. Here now, a view from Anna Krakatau. You see the recent lava flows over to the caldera margin. This is Sir Chung Island. And uh, here we uh, have a lot of vegetation on the older islands. And uh, the young island in the, in the center, Anna Krakatau, has virtually no vegetation at this point. Here is a PhD student for scale, a kneeling PhD student trying to pick obsidians out of the 1883 deposits. And this is... Uh, uh, 
the lower part of the deposits, they're tens of meters thick, and it's all made of ash and little pumice stones. So this is only very, very much on the caldera margin here. This is only very close, very proximal to the eruptive vent. And uh, the thickness would have decreased, of course, further away, but it's a massive deposit once you stand there. So looking out at sea, I noticed a dark black object through the gloom is then reported, and it's coming towards the shore. So uh, here's some reports on the tsunami that was caused by this huge eruption. All this material being thrown into the sea would have caused a big uh, uh, tsunami. And in the aftermath of this, some 290 coastal villages were devastated. And estimates today suggest that uh, about 36 1,400 something people died, and uh, there's this probably a, a low estimate. And uh, well, thousands were injured, of course. It appears beyond doubt, however, that the whole of the southeastern coast of Sumatra must have suffered severely from the effects of the sudden influx of the sea. So this eruption was not actually, the eruption itself was not the main uh, reason for all the devastation. It was the secondary effects. It was the tsunami that was caused by this huge eruption happening to be in an awkward spot with a lot of population in, uh, the, um, in the land areas surrounding the Sunda Strait. This is an intriguing situation that I came across here. This is a little vessel, a Dutch vessel, the Beru, and it was picked up by the tsunami. And it was moved for something like two miles up a river. And uh, here it is, it was kind of left by the tsunami. It was picked up several times. There was passengers uh, from other vessels that had reported this. The ship was transported high on the crest of a mighty wall of green water, it was reported. It was swept westwards for a mile until it was crashed down. And then it was picked up again. So uh, later on, when it was found, it's reported that she lies there almost completely intact. The engines themselves were not damaged. And uh, it might be possible to float her again, some people reported. And the last report I found is then from 1939. It's still lying there, rusting in, uh, uh, in the jungle. And apparently a colony of monkeys had kind of made it their home at this point. So here is um, a little image of how the tsunami wave might have traveled. We are um, in the Sunda Strait, and uh, the numbers here on the little map, they are travel times in minutes. So here, the uh, travel time to Batavia, which is just on the right of the little map, uh, we can't see it, would be about two hours, and it would have reached uh, far distant shores like uh, Madagascar and places like that. And there was dev devastation mainly in the Indonesian part of um, uh, the map here, but the waves would have also reached far, far, far further. <coughs> So, um, Lloyd's agent in Batavia sent the following message to London at that time. The island of Krakatau, the summit of which, um, uh, of which peak was uh, 2,600 feet above the water, uh, has totally disappeared beneath the sea. And the neighboring island is split in five parts. 60 new volcanic islands have been formed. I think he was overdoing it a little. Um, the sub agent uh, was a bit more precise. He basically said, all gone, plenty of life lost. Ship logs uh, have frequent entries like, um, um, uh, recorded frequent entries like this in August 1883. And uh, well, it's not as nice to read, but um, there has been loads of people that were washed into the sea. There was groups of dead bodies floating there, groups of 50 or 100 packed together. And uh, it went all the way to Zanzibar. The, uh, the headmistress of a school there reported that uh, the boys were much ab uh, amused uh, by finding on the beach stones which would float, and also they found bones there. So, um, this was quite serious. The aftermath of the eruption was even more serious because uh, there was a lot of damage to local infrastructure and also to agriculture. Here's some plants from the area around Merapi. These happen to be tobacco plants. And uh, as you see, there's ash on it. And the little ash grains, they burn little holes into the leaves and it makes the crops die. So owing to the covering of ashes, it was reported back then by Mr. Cameron, um, 
that uh, a lot of the, the crops died and the cattle are deprived of their ordinary nourishment. So a mild famine set in after the eruption as well. And in fact, there was quite a revolt in many places by the local people against the Dutch colonial power because, uh, well, things didn't go so well at that point. There was also some uh, weather effects and um, two weeks after the eruption Europe was gifted with a series of memorable sunsets and uh, strong afterglows and for example artists like Ashcroft he painted uh, something like 530 watercolors just to capture this and uh, the lower gray um, black and white image is uh, it's a French image uh, from Paris this was the weather phenomena that were recorded there and uh, this added to the mystery around Krakatau I believe so, now, let's uh, move and do a little bit more geology. Here we have the Sunda Strait, Krakatau Island, uh, the islands of Krakatau in the center. The uh, red stars are boreholes in the area. And here now a satellite image of how it looks today. The caldera margin, you can just about pick it out. Um, it's a circular feature. And we have Anna Krakatau, the steaming little volcano in the middle. Here a few impressions of present day uh, Krakatau with Anna Krakatau in the middle. And Dr. Fairbeck, who had been there to, um, on the island, um, he um, reported that um, he believes that uh, the caldera will actually get a renewed activity. And uh, he predicted that it will be like Kameni in the Santorini Island group, um, that there will be a new island growing. And indeed, he was right. Anna Krakatau rose a little while after uh, the 1883 events. And uh, we believe that this is, if you will, the start of a new cycle. And that Krakatau might go through multiple cycles, or has gone through multiple cycles, and we might be just at the beginning of a new cycle. And uh, this, uh, in, uh, this, is, this started in June 1927. There was random eruptions and bubbles in the center of the caldera, and it manifested itself in a little <laughs> island that finally rose in January 26, 1928, above sea level. And uh, the new land grew until it formed a hump little island that people called Anna Krakatau. Here a few impressions from the 1960s to present day. The island grows with enormous speed. It's uh, fascinating. It's uh, believed to be the fastest growing volcanic edifice in the world. It grows at uh, something like uh, eight centimeters a week. And uh, this makes it one of the fastest growing volcanoes. Here is a very short sequence of a small eruption from August uh, 17th, 2008. This is just about uh, two minutes. And uh, it's very dangerous to be on the island, uh, particularly when it's active. And uh, each of these little poofs or eruptions adds to the island's growth. And it's phenomenally active. So I spent a night there once, but I didn't feel very good, I have to admit. So here are a few more impressions from Anna Krakatau. And here, um, this is a little expedition up to Anna Krakatau crater. We checked the seismic records. It was very quiet at that time. But you see immediately there's, that there's bomb impact sacks everywhere on the island. So there is no safe place once the volcano erupts. Then uh, you are in big danger. Then the bombs get bigger and bigger the higher up you go. And uh, the one in the lower right-hand side, well, it's, it's man-sized. So this is the kind of bombs thrown out of the volcano. The 1960s crater, which is the one on the lower left, uh, on the inside of the crater, you see all these impact sites. It's like a lunar landscape. And once the volcano erupts, there is, as I said, no safe place. Well, I was quite proud when I was up there, so I was posing on the crater. Here's a few impressions of it. And uh, the crater emits a lot of gas, and um, it's, uh, you can sometimes feel a tremor there as well. So you really don't want to be on the island for too long. And um, then uh, we camped uh, on several occasions on some of the uh, uh, Caldera Rim Islands. And there, sometimes you're lucky enough to see um, the eruption at night. And uh, here's our little camp that we put up and uh, sampled. 
and it's nice because you can buy fish from local fishermen and you make your little fish barbecue there. So here's some PhD students enjoying the local produce. There's some wildlife there as well, and um, it's a bit hmm, distressing when they come close to the camp. So um, you're not really supposed to do any damage to these animals, but uh, we had to find some ways. So pumice stones were helpful. But here's now a little bit on rocks. So we have the big 1883 material, the big eruption, and there's some pumices with some obsidian. While Anna Krakatau is a very different beast. It produces mainly basaltic andesites, but it's got a lot of inclusions. And uh, there's crustal inclusions, as well as mantle type inclusions. And uh, all of them tell us something about how Krakatau might work on the inside. So, uh, most of you are familiar with this. Um, we are really dealing with rhyolites for the 1883 eruption and with uh, basalt and andesite for the current type of eruption. So there's a huge uh, spectrum of compositions, but we have a bit of a gap, a co compositional gap in between. So we're talking really two different types of magma being present, and that comes out here in the total alkali versus silica diagram. The 1883 one circled in red, the present day eruption are much more mafic, and I've circled some of them in blue. The inclusions are rather intriguing. We call them xeno pumice, foreign pumice, because many of them are frothed up, but they're actually not pumice. So here's some sediments on the left-hand side that must come from under Krakatau, frost up sediments, but we also see some frost up gabbros, and that's the rocks um, highlighted in blue there. And we get some strange minerals. There is um, this um, light-colored grain in the green box at the lower part. This is a cordierite. So this must be from a contact aureole somewhere down in the volcano, suggesting that there's a lot of interaction between the magma and the surrounding rock. And uh, the Sunda Strait has something like six kilometers of rather young, fresh sediment. And I'm speculating that uh, this has something to do with the explosive nature of Krakatau. These sediments might add a lot of water, for example, and they might make the magma also more viscous. And I think this could be an explanation for why Anna Krakatau is quite vicious, actually. So, um, I don't want to bore you too much with mineral chemistry, but we've done a lot of mineral analysis. Here's our pyroxene data. And uh, you have to do a lot of equilibrium tests in order to get some pressures out of this. So we did these equilibrium tests and we filtered the data really rigorously in order to come up with some pressure estimates. And here it is, our pyroxene information for the Anna Krakatau uh, lavas. They yield pressure estimates in the region of eight to 12 kilometers, making us con confident that there is some sort of a magma reservoir at this depth beneath the caldera today. Now we also did the same thing for plagioclase and um, it's uh, less well constrained but uh, we also have less data for this but we got some good numbers and uh, if you do the same thing with the various barometers we achieved a result and the result is that there may be a magma system that crystallizes a lot of plagioclase at four to six kilometers. So this is shallower than the one that crystallizes the pyroxene, seemingly at least. If this is correct, then we should be dealing with something like two magma systems at least, and our barometry results are on the right-hand side. There's two major peaks, one at about uh, four kilometers and the other one at about eight to 12, as I said. And interestingly, um, there was a seismic tomography study that became available in 2011, and it actually shows two major anomalies, one pretty close to the surface and one further down with a bit of a gap in between. So we were reasonably in with our mineral barometry that there is something to this. Now, the individual chambers or reservoirs can't be resolved within this uh, seismic tomography, but uh, there's estimates that the fluid content, the magma content, is on the order of about 30%. So my interpretation is that these large anomalies in the seismic tomography, they're actually more like uh, an affected area, and we are probably dealing with little pockets of magma in there rather than with giant uh, magma systems. <laughs> So, if this is all true, and uh, we have a little reservoir close to the surface, then, yeah, we ought to see some sedimentary input. 
So let's test this hypothesis uh, of the sediments uh, having an effect on the eruptive pattern and the way Krakatau behaves. And uh, I said this earlier, there's drill holes in the area. We know there is a lot of sediment in the Sunda Strait. And uh, I speculate that this has an effect. Here is some uh, data from the oil industry. There is a, a thick succession of sediments, local immature sediments, clay stones, sandstones, siltstones, and all that kind of thing. And uh, these would then be right in the level where this upper magma reservoir would be placed. So this magma reservoir under Anna Krakatau might be sitting in these sediments and therefore it might interact with them. And I believe that this is the reason for all these uh, sedimentary xenoliths as well as these contact metamorphic minerals that we find in the Anna Krakatau lavas. Here's a few more impressions. I find them quite fascinating. And they are so frothy, they must have given up a lot of gas. Here's a few more of the cordierites. And the sample on the top right is a sediment with cordierite um, um, domains or little um, uh, clusters in them. And uh, they must come from contact metamorphic reactions. So the magma is reacting with these sediments to some degree. So this is how I picture this together with the barometry on the right-hand side. The rocks that we see as center this, they help us reconstruct this. And here we argue that there is a, a suite of pockets in the, lower par in the upper part of the plumbing system. Then we might have a somewhat larger area at a depth of about 12 kilometers with larger pockets. And we believe there is likely some lower crust hot zone or something of this nature uh, in the upper mantle lower crust that supplies the whole system. System. Now, these uh, sedimentary xenoliths are very intriguing. Here's a few false color SEM images that uh, describe them. You see the, the bubbly nature of them. They're really in a state of disintegration. And these immature sediments, they may contain a lot of water. And uh, this is done on our little uh, microprobe in Uppsala. And uh, here's just some very, very rough kind of uh, back of the envelope calculations. If we think about sediments with high porosity, immature sediments, and uh, think about how much water they might contain, not even as mineral water, but as pore water, and we get this into our magmatic system, we can actually push up the water content of our magma quite considerably. And these numbers are not very real. Uh, I don't think they are too well constrained. I'm just wanting to make the point that these sediments could have potentially quite a huge effect on the volatile budget of these eruptive sequences. Now, is this all true or am I making this up? It's a good question I asked myself. So I went to look at some crystals here. The plagioclases, I argued earlier, were growing rather shallow. If this is true, shouldn't we see some sedimentary input in the outer layers of our zone plagioclases? And uh, here we did some laser work, and this was done at Washington State in the US. And I just want to draw your attention to the lower right-hand diagram. Here we have a calcium um, profile in blue, and we have strontium isotopes from core to rim, and that's the um, um, pink uh, to purple boxes. And uh, the error bars are the width of these boxes. So here we see that there is actually an increase from core to rim, and it's significant if you compare core and rim. If you compare individual zones, it's more delicate, but there is an increase in strontium towards the outer rims of these crystals. And this would imply that we have sedimentary input into these pockets <coughs> that are sitting quite shallow under the volcano. Here's just another example. This is core rim. Um, um, well, this is rim core rim, and we have a little bit of an increase in strontium isotopes on either side. So, if we look at the um, distribution between the uh, anothite, the calcium content, and the strontium isotope ratios, then uh, we're getting a huge spread for these um, uh, feldspars that come up at Anna Krakatau. It's not a simple scenario. It's not a closed system at all. There seems to be a big spread going towards variable inputs of probably <coughs> sediment in order to explain the rather elevated strontium-strontium signal here. 
Here is a, a summary diagram of all the various um, uh, samples we took and the various xenolith. And uh, if we look at the, the Anna Krakatau lavas, this is the little brown box on the right-hand side, then uh, it all looks very simple. But if we separate certain crystals and uh, look at ground mass, etc., then we find that uh, the spread in strontium isotopes becomes bigger. The 1883 is even bigger. And then we have looked at some crystals from the 1883 that uh, is the the light brown box here next to the red 1883 box, and there we find that the crystals are also uh, quite crustally affected. So it's not just a current phenomenon, it must have affected the 1883 magmas as well. And if we look at some of these frothy xenoliths, whoa, they shoot up in strontium isotopes, so they are likely the source for these elevated values. Here's a little compilation, and I'm terribly sorry, it's a little on the small side, but here's all the data that we have produced, as well as those from the literature. And uh, the black big box in the lower part, that's what we believe to be the mantle in the area. And uh, the other bars are the affected compositions that we see. And whether you look at strontium, oxygen, lead, helium isotopes, Everything suggests that we have sedimentary input. The only thing we don't see is limestone, but there is no limestone in the Sunda Strait, to the best of my knowledge, and therefore there is no anomaly in Delta 13C, but we checked for it. So it seems to be a siliciclastic input. It's likely the sedimentary successions that we find in the top few kilometers of the Sunda Strait. This is peculiar and it's unique to Krakatau because the other volcanoes don't sit in the other volcanoes in Indonesia. They don't sit within the Sunda Strait. So this is one of the reasons why I think Krakatau is different to many of the other volcanoes there. Now, how relevant is that? Here's a little bit of energy constrained uh, AFC modeling and I will spare you the details. <coughs> if we look at the headline there, it says it all. Anna Krakatau records up to about 10% of sedimentary input and the 1883 eruption records a lot more, up to about 23% of sedimentary input. So both the current as well as the older rocks record interaction with the sediments of the Sunda Strait and uh, as I said this is likely a reason for the peculiar nature of Krakatau. Here I'd like to start wrapping this up and uh, I put the timeline up there, the 60,000 BP eruption, I don't know how real it is so I don't think we can put too much value on this but if we believe in the 530 AD eruption and the 1883 then we must realize that we have something like 1500 years between the start of a caldera cycle and a big gigantic eruption. If this is true, then we are just at the next phase <clears throat> and we might have another 1,000 or 1,500 years before Krakatau will do its thing again, provided it has the same supply rate as it is. So if we look at this little um, uh, image on the right hand side where I've drawn some pockets over the seismic um, tomography, then this might be what the present situation looks like. In order to get a big 1883 eruption, we need something larger. We really need to convert this area to magma. And this can only be done by sustained supply of mafic material into this upper level. And possibly also associated with more sedimentary melting and crustal assimilation, pr producing a more rhyolitic suite that can be super explosive. So, the end, well, the end is the beginning, the end is always the beginning of something new, as the Japanese say, and here I believe that Krakatau is building up again, but we are only at the very early stage of a new caldera cycle, and I don't think we will see another 1883 style eruption from Krakatau uh, within our lifetime. It'll take another 1,000 to 1,500 years at least, I believe, before Krakatau is ready to blow its top in a big scale again. So, intriguingly, I think um, you can compare the life cycle of Krakatau to the life cycle of this band, Krakatau. I never listened to them, but I uh, checked them out on the internet. They started off as a school band in the lower right, uh, lower left. Then they became a little famous, and then uh, even more kind of established, and then, well, they got forgotten. But I hear there's a few punk band in Russia that calls themselves Krakatau, starting, if you will, a new cycle. So, 
Thank you very much, and uh, hopefully I can get this animation to work. Instead of providing a set of conclusions, I um, had one of the students whose brother is in animation um, do this little thing. So here's my, my reconstruction of Anna Krakatau uh, as it is today, the plumbing system, with a few sporadic pockets supplying the current volcano. And here's, on the right-hand side, the Krakatau 1883 reconstruction with a lush with a larger, much larger system sitting right under the volcano, defining even the shape of the caldera. And uh, I would argue it would take a little bit more of crustal preconditioning as it's known within the petrology field um, to, in order to make a larger system like the 1883 one that can then lead to another gigantic eruption like we've seen there. Well, I don't think that we will get away with 36,000 casualties in the next 1883 eruption. It'll be a lot more devastating, I believe. The population densities are a lot higher, infrastructure is a huge problem, and uh, naval traffic is another issue. But as I said, we are quite a bit away from that. It's not our direct concern today. But in the long run, I think it's unavoidable. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, time for a few questions, if anybody's got some. On the light, no, behind the lights. Any questions? So, Love. are there some major forces, something that um, channeled this lava up? Yes, a good question, perfect question, actually. Um, there is this kink in this abduction zone. Um, there's Sumatra and there's Java. And uh, it seems that uh, there's a graben type system here in the middle because of this breakup. And the subduction speeds are a little different um, uh, from when we compare Sumatra to Java. And uh, therefore, it seems that we're breaking this whole thing up, and that's exactly where Krakatau sits. And uh, so there's a tectonic influence as well as the sedimentary kind of successions that fill this basin, this graben system in there. And uh, one can speculate that this graben type situation will actually increase the magma production in the mantle a little bit to start with. And then there's all these phenomena I tried to highlight today on top of that. So yes, structures play a major role there quite often. 